Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. <coughs> well, this video is a, uh, the first video of a series of videos I'm planning to talk about the supporting evidence for G2 gravity. Yeah, but before we do that, let me uh, give us a short word, if I can find it, about our book. Sorry for the pause and delay, but uh, you can get a book that Dave and I wrote on Amazon, and uh, you can get hardcover, paperback, and ebook. Ebook for only three dollars. So we're talking about supporting evidence. And this is my list of what I'm covering. We can see and feel gravity one. Uh, <coughs> that's, that's the uh, gravity that we have, Newtonian type gravity or general relativity. And then we'll talk about refraction, magnetic field. These are the other ones I'm going to cover later. Okay, uh, <coughs> we're not talking about proof. I have a video titled uh, TPM, There Is No Proof. So I'm going to go through that a little bit to clarify what I mean about indirect evidence. To prove something, you need direct evidence. If you have indirect evidence, you do not, you do not have proof. You have supporting evidence for your theory. When you have enough supporting evidence, your theory may be consider seriously considered. But direct evidence, you can, you can have that. Some physical events are easy to prove because we have direct evidence. We see the apple fall to the earth, the moon orbiting the earth, the earth orbiting the sun. This is direct evidence of motion. But now gravity one, I'm saying, is indirect evidence for gravity two. Gravity one, again, is Newton or Einstein's type of gravity. It moves large objects like the Earth, Moon, and asteroids. And, but Newton used motion, motion of the apple, the moon, and the Earth, to infer that there was a force called gravity. Newton had direct evidence of motion, and he, he used it as indirect evidence of gravity. He says, it appeared to him, analyzing it, that all those motions could be caused by the one and same uh, function of gravity. Motion is supporting evidence for gravity, but if we had direct evidence of gravity, then we would know what gravity really is. And of course, the problem solved. Okay, the first uh, one I'm going to cover is actually the the uh, work that I had done hel that helped me determine that there was a level two gravity. Uh, I had just introduced the concept of TPM light. So I have a stream of particles coming here, bending this way and then bending back. And I said to myself, what force do I need to cause that light to bend? And I drew this line. And I noticed then that this was down, uh, down here. It also bent again. And what force would be required to uh, cause the light to bend there? And then I said, well, wait a minute. I've been drawing force lines around objects like that for 10 years. This is an example of that. Here's the Earth, and here's G1 gravity, Newtonian, Einstein, or G, uh, just or G1 gravity. So I just drew this. I took a prism and drew these lines around it. This is not precise. I didn't try to calculate the angle they, they should be at. But the general idea is that you've got force lines all around an object for, with G2 gravity that you see with G1. So indirectly, we see that G2, uh, G1 gravity supports the idea that there could be a G2. Now, if you actually uh, look at an, uh, a, an atom at uh, our level, it has a, an N1, a nucleus, and a G1, an orbital. And one of the reasons that works 
is because there has to be a G2 gravity, another gravity, uh, causing that, uh, well, I'll say it in a different terms, or causing the electron to orbit the proton. In a TPM case, it's the uh, a G1 to orbit the N1. So you, uh, you, you have G1 supporting uh, the uh, G2 gravity in kind of an indirect sense. But in another sense, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it is a supporting evidence. So let's compare gravity forces. Newtonian gravity, G1 gravity, which moves at about speed C, is the controlling force when you throw three balls with the same force and the same horizontal plane and it's a lead, wood, and cotton ball, gravity, Newtonian gravity or Einstein's gravity, uh, will cause them to flow that way. You'll, it's very obvious you can go outside and do that. Now, Coulomb's law, on the other hand, is uh, what you, they, you can use to explain the orbit of the electron around the proton. And it has in its equation uh, Q1 and Q2. And, uh, it, but when you look at it, it looks very much like G1 gravity. But in the TPM model, we don't have charge. There is no charge on the G1. G1 is not negative, and the N1 is not positive. And you replace that uh, with, uh, uh, you replace the charge with mass and you get a very similar equation to Newton's equation. But the thing about this is, this is TPM light moving at speed C. If you're moving at speed C, you have to have a force that's faster. Otherwise, if you're looking at the, the light moving this way, and the G gravity chasing it, it never catches up. Just can't get there from there. So this gravity, this G2 gravity must be much, much faster than light, just like Newtonian gravity moving at speed C is faster than the lead, wood, and cotton balls. G2 is much, much faster than light, yes. Okay, magnetic field. G1 current controls the flow. This is a simple circuit. I had just finished refraction. This is very early on in the development of the TPM model. I had just finished that, and I was going to apply uh, and, and look at magnetism and, and see what I could, uh, could be uh, established. Well, I started with a simple battery, resistor, and a copper wire for, uh, for building a magnetic field. We know this happens. Hans Christian Orsted did some original experiments that showed that when current flowing, current flowing through a wire produced a magnetic field. But he thought it was a circular magnetic field. Well, in, at any case, then, we have a, a battery, a resistor, and this, and the question comes up, if the magnetic field is, is probably very fast, small particles, then where does it come from? Where does that particle come from? And you look at this circuit, there's a battery resistor and a copper wire. That's all you've got. But there are G1 particles or electrons uh, coming through this way. Now, in uh, so I, had, I asked myself the question, these G1s must be coming from the battery. The resistor doesn't generate, copper wire doesn't. And the most likely source of the uh, G1 particle is the orbital of the atom, the electron in normal terms, G1 in our terms. And over time, we have learned, to, we are, in fact, I just stated earlier that the G1 current, it moves at speed C. Yeah, I know they, there's different answers from other people, but it moves at speed C and it moves around here. Then I asked myself the question, why does the uh, magnetic field move in a circle use, uh, using the right-hand rule? And the only way I could come up with that is to assume that G1 current, this is the black, uh, black is the G1 current moving at speed C, 
uh, that that current must be flowing in a uh, that follows the right hand rule. It always follows. Doesn't matter when you do this test. The uh, magnetic field goes in the direction of the uh, the current and gives you a counterclockwise uh, magnetic field. And so I'm asking myself, where does that come from? Well, I got G1s flowing through here, and if the black current is a spiral. So you could ask yourself your question, well, why would it go in a spiral? Why not a straight line? Well, why does an asteroid uh, bend uh, its path? It never it wouldn't go through our galaxy in a straight line. So if the copper wire was well organized with copper atoms, then you, then you could actually see they, they would tend towards this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and that's your spiral. So uh, I assume then that the, it, was, it wasn't a straight line, but that the G1 current, which is black, moved in a spiral. Well, th that gave the possibility for the uh, magnetic field to move in a spiral. And uh, so I'm assuming that that magnetic field is the release of G1s and they get trapped by G2 gravity to keep it moving in a circle as Orsted had indicated. Uh, red is the G1 magnetic field and blue the net force of G2 gravity. So you need, in this case, uh, 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 this is of course three-dimensional around the copper wire. And you need a force to hold it right there, otherwise it fly away. Okay, uh, control of the magnetic field. This is quite interesting. Accelerates going in and decelerates going out. <coughs> so I assume that the center of mass of the magnet is there and there would be a strong G2 force there and a strong G2 force there. What's interesting is to show, take that force and put it in two vector, uh, supporting vectors. This, uh, this line is in the same direction it's going. This line is in the direction of causing it to turn. And uh, the opposite is true here. So it accelerates going in and it decelerates going out because this is an opposing force. This, uh, this is decreasing the, vo the velocity and this is perpendicular to that turning it. So you, you have F2, G2 gravity, controlling it such that the magnetic field accelerates to here and then decelerates out. Acceleration in, deceleration going out. Okay, so we have supporting evidence, and right here I realized I didn't put gravity in. We have supporting evidence for gravity, uh, jab gravity one that supports it, refraction and magnetic field. Uh, this is, by the way, the list of other ones I'm going to be going through in, in the next videos. Well, see, there's the gravity one. I did copy it, this slide over to the other one. These are the uh, uh, extra ones. I'm going into statics. Uh, going to electrical with parallel resistors and G1 current through a circuit. And then I'll go through electronics where I can discuss the diode and the transistor. My name is Bobby Hilster and I am your particle model guru. If you ask, have a question, ask particle.